Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. Here is the news. Now, were you one of those who had trouble understanding the dialogue in Monday's showing of Jamaica Inn on BBC One? The BBC says it's launched an investigation after receiving nearly 800 complaints, with people saying there was too much mumbling by the actors. The number of complaints had snowballed up to 2,182 by the end of the three-night run, although by then two-thirds of the audience had stopped watching what was a top-of-the-shop literary drama that ought to have been a credit to the corporation. Arts correspondent David Silito's snarky BBC News report took in-house self-flagellation to W1A levels. We must know and understand each other. Now, did you catch that? Listen carefully. Nope. I watched episode one on catch up, so I had no complaint. Also, I like the nervous energy of actor Sean Harris and mumbling in general. And I can't help thinking the exponential monathon became a self fulfilling daily mail reader prophecy after the BBC's own goal department stepped in. But clearly, we want actors to speak clearly. Just like any American film made in the 70s, or The Wire, or Shetland, you just had to tune into the dialogue. Their eyes eaten by the fish on their flesh hanging off in ribbons. We don't understand you. Downton's Jessica Brown Findlay speaking for the 2182 there. If you prefer Daphne du Maurier's Cornish pub based shipwreckers saga with perfect BBC diction, try Alfred Hitchcock's clipped 1939 adaptation, also his worst film. This one, written by the White Queen's talented Emma Frost, was a drop of the hard stuff, which spoke volumes with its silences. Are you Joshua Merlin? Where's my aunt here? I'm patience. Shot in Cornwall, as well as Cumbria and Yorkshire, all of which make a change from Budapest, Belfast and Johannesburg, Jamaica Inn looked as muddy and unpredictable as it sounded. Directed with elemental power by Philippa Lothorpe, it maintained the right costume drama balance between windswept and interesting. Take that nag. I brought her for you. I don't want it. We'll take her anyway. There might come a time you'd rather not be here, and if there is, you'll need her. On the evidence of Jessica Brown Findlay's impressive full-blooded turn as the headstrong heroine, Lady Sybil's untimely death may have been the best thing that ever happened to her. You've only got until April the 30th to catch it on iPlayer, and the BBC might have let it on a bit longer in the vexed circumstances, but I recommend it. Have I made myself clear? I don't follow. Of course you don't follow, nobody fucking follows. Ah, the welcome return of Boss to Morphor, with the less welcome knowledge that this, its second season, is also its last, as it was cancelled by Stars in 2012. For anyone who missed the booming, striding, confident first helping of the Chicago House of Cards, here's all you need to know about Kelsey Grammer's cold-blooded mare. It's called Louis Body. Degenerative progression is slow, irreversible, and there is no known cure. Oh, and this. Every person who has plotted against me will feel the force of my wrath. No one will be left unscathed. Created by Farhad Safinia, Boss basically takes all the jokes and Democrats out of the West Wing. In that show, President Bartlett failed to disclose multiple sclerosis. Mayor Tom Kane has a progressive degenerative dementia, which, dramatically speaking, leads to frequent episodes of cosmic reflection. and a galvanised resolve to push through unpopular policy. City of I will. I will. City of I will. Always preferred that city motto to the one about it being a garden. Don't do that. Sir? Don't interrupt me with attempts at relevance. Fans of HBO's Looking will have spotted Jonathan Groff there, who was set up as Kane's new right-hand man in this fine first episode, written by season two's new showrunner Dee Johnson, now with Nashville. I'll look forward to her final episode, although not to the fact that it'll be the final episode. And so to Rev, which has gone to a better place, and I don't mean Netflix.
Usually, when a much-loved show ends, we blame the commissioning editors and channel controllers for knowing not what they do. But in the case of BBC Two's sanctified sitcom, it's a scent to TV heaven appears to have been a creative, not an executive decision after three maturing series. So we must give our blessing to co-creator James Wood and star Tom Hollander for going out while they're on the top. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he, and I lead you all wherever you may be, and I lead you all in the dance, said he. This was the penultimate episode, which aired audaciously on Easter Monday, and depicted the figurative crucifixion and resurrection of Adam Smallbone, complete with inner city reboots of various aspects of the Passion. I don't know him. Yes, you do. No, I don't. How many times do I have to tell you I don't know him? Fucking burger alarm! Get it fixed, you massive cock! I hope I don't have to explain it. And look who they rustled up for an uncredited cameo as God. You can't make an omelette without cracking some eggs. Right, thanks. It doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. I see. We are what we eat. Yep. You buy cheap, you buy twice. The open hand has the strongest grip. It's OK, you can stop now. Sad to see it go, but we'll never see it go downhill. Now, for any of you playing Game of Thrones cast members in historical Channel 4 miniseries New World's Bingo, eyes down for the final time. Here's Ralph Finchy Innocent, last seen in Season 2 of GOT as Dagmar Clefjaw as New England settler Stackpole. Was it hell when those redskins burst into camp and murdered poor Henry Cresswell? and Donald Sumter, a.k.a. the loyal Maester Lewin, as veteran Republican agitator Algernon Sidney. To a new world. A new world. Which, along with Joe Dempsey, Michael McElhatton, James Cosmo and Patrick Malahide, completes a grand total of six, making New Worlds the most Game of Thrones drama on telly. Unless you know different. So, from the sublime to Derek. Returning to Channel 4 and Netflix for its second series, Ricky Gervais' difficult fourth British TV comedy. And although its dowdy care home setting and emphasis on kindness set it apart from the hard-bitten media satire of extras and life's too short, its good intentions are threatened by the mannered portrayal of ingenue Derek himself. It's my best sister ever. My dad's moving in. Join us. Join in my family. His, his family as well now. When I'm like this as well, when I'm happiest, I get sad sometimes. Because I feel sorry for people who are as happy as me. Well, we can applaud Gervais for attempting something in a minor key and empathise with his desire to honestly depict a workplace some of his family actually work in. The show's button pushing mawkishness is ruthless. Derek loves watching it. In episode one, they brazenly used a DVD supplied by the Invisible Documentary Crew as a narrative driver to recycle the death of an elderly resident with Alzheimer's from series one, thus doubling the touching moment's tear harvest. And they call it the clone. Me shop and me stall, I lay down on the street. The rest of the cast give nuanced naturalistic performances. Kerry Godleyman, David Earle, Brett Goldstein, new arrival Colin Holt, even Courtchester Carl Pilkington. But with Gervais writing, producing, directing and starring, there seems to be nobody around to remind him to stay in character. Close your eyes and he's just Ricky Gervais. It's shocking that, wasn't it? I've never seen that before. Only one sucking special brew out of a carpet. Not even Kev. Surprised me. He acted quickly, didn't he? He acted on instinct. He sort of saw it seeping away, so he had to do an extra fast slurping. It was the noise that was worrying. I'm not a trained psychoanalyst, but perhaps he's just hoping the same kindness is paid to him as Derek pays to everyone else. If I qualify and say that I still have a lot of time for Gervais, I realise that's what every critic's saying, but I do. I just don't have any for Derek. And I wish they'd close that piano. Your moment of everyday racism this week comes from Mad Men. Here's senior partner Bert, played by Robert Morse, announcing his candidacy for UKIP. Luckily, they didn't have Twitter in 1969. I'm all for the national advancement of coloured people, but I do not believe they should advance all the way to the front of this office. People can see her from the elevator. <laughs> 